Good morning and welcome to Travis Baptist this morning. If we stand, we'll get started with singing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray. supremely let us love each other too let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new then he'll call us home to heaven at his table we'll sit down Christ will gird himself with sweet manna all around. Today's scripture reading is from John 17, 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, what a good thing it is to know that we are one with you. And because we are one with you, we can be one with each other. Different people, different backgrounds, different races, different upbringings, different likes, dislikes, all of those things, Lord. And yet, because of you, we are one. One body, one family in you. Teach us, Lord, daily to set aside differences that don't matter. And to be focused on what does unite us. And we pray, God, that as we do this, indeed, this neighborhood, this city will see that you love Travis Baptist Church and you love them. That when they see the unity we share together. Sometimes, Lord, the devil wants to destroy that, but we're going to be strong against the devil and we're going to pray your protection, your hedge about us, your power over us. Because we know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So we will not fear that, Lord. We will unite in you. And we pray this morning as we struggle through our lives, in relationships, in our jobs, in our schoolwork, in the everyday drudgeries we go through, Lord, that can be such a drag on us. We're praying, God, you'll give us hope. You'll give us encouragement. You'll help us overcome the challenges we're facing, the shortfalls that are coming upon us. Lord, that you will provide more than enough for us to be everything you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, through the struggles we go through. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all, and you can be seated. We are glad you're here with us today. It is the fall. We're in November now. Can you believe it? You got one more month after this one, and you're done with 2024. Uh, but we got uh, just a couple weeks left in our Operation Christmas Child. Operation Christmas Child is the shoebox we put together every year with gifts for kids in other countries. And uh, we've got a table out there with all the details on it. We've got a video here to encourage you to pray and to give towards that. So let's watch the video. 
Greatest Journey Discipleship Program is a wonderful way for children to know who Jesus is, to grow in that faith, but then to go and share it with others. This is a tool that will allow children to become evangelists and to multiply followers of Christ around the world. After the children receive their shoebox gift, they are invited to participate in a 12-lesson discipleship course called The Greatest Journey. During The Greatest Journey, the children will learn Bible stories, play fun activities, and learn memory verses that help them get to know who Jesus is and then become equipped to share that faith with others. Genesis 1 1 in the beginning. Every teacher attends a Greatest Journey training and receives a teacher guide that complements the student workbook. The training equips the teacher to disciple children and ultimately to help children get to know Jesus better and to walk with him and follow him. During the graduation, the children will receive their very own personalized certificate saying that they completed all 12 lessons of The Greatest Journey, and they will receive their very own Greatest Journey New Testament Bible. For many children, this will be the first Bible that their family has ever owned. With their Greatest Journey certificate in one hand and their Greatest Journey New Testament Bible in the other, Children who graduate from The Greatest Journey are now equipped to go out and share the gospel with friends, family, and others in their community. We prepare these shoe boxes with school supplies and small toys and thing, hygiene products, things like that. And then um, uh, when they're shipped to their individual countries, they include the greatest journey in the particular language that the, is native to the children and where the boxes are going. And so you can rest assured, we're not just giving out Christmas presents. We're also giving them the gospel and a means whereby they might begin to grow in Christ and reach out to their friends. So this is definitely a mission project. So as you consider doing a shoe box, um, as I said, we got the table in the foyer with the details on it. Also, there will be a pack and party this afternoon at 3.30. If you want to join that, uh, that will be going on, okay? Um, I believe we're just a couple weeks away from the day we need to ship them, so make sure you're getting your box ready. And it does cost us $10 per box to ship, so if you would, you can just put that in the offering envelope and designate it shoe box, $10, and that will make, go to the right spot, okay? And uh, we are grateful for your help in that. Um, we do have kind of a busy day today. We do have the... Uh, uh, shoebox party. We also, uh, this afternoon, um, there will be a cooking class in the fellowship hall at 5.30. At uh, 5 o'clock we begin exhibitions out at the Corpus Christi Baptist Association. Uh, that will be out at New Life at the Cross Church in Robstown. That is, uh, I believe it's 4671 six, Farm Road 1649, I believe it is. Right on the edge of Petronila, if you just take Weber Road out that way, you'll take a right on 1649. Or you can take the Highway 44 out to the airport, past the airport till you come to 1649, take a right, and uh, the church will be right there. Um, so... Uh, come and join us for that this evening, and uh, that'll begin. The exhibitions begin at 5. The service begins at 6. I encourage you, because you give $10,000 at least every year to the Corpus Christi Baptist Association. You ought to see what the Lord's doing with your money, don't you think? So, come on out and join us this evening out there at New Life at the Cross. Check your emails, because on Thursday I sent everybody in the church an email with the um, uh, the map link um, to get out there so um, so that you can make it all right and uh, so we want to remember those things and then on Tuesday evening we will be having the ladies Bible study at 630 on Wednesday we've got a at 620 for the kids and then the adults have a prayer meeting Bible study at 630 in the fellowship hall um, and so keep those things in mind 
And uh, if you're here for the first time, or the first time in a long time, we do have a, a little form here on our bulletin. If you're our guest, we would love to get some information from you so we can get some more information to you about our church. This just kind of tears right off. It can be dropped in the offering plate on your when it comes by or handed to me on the way out. We would appreciate you doing that. And then um, also if you want to update prayer requests, phone numbers, anything along that line, um, you can use that little form. Uh, we would appreciate it, okay? And let us take a few moments now to go around and welcome each other into the Lord's house. As we make it back to our places, we will continue to stand. As we make it back, let's go ahead and sing, The Longer I Serve Him. Since I started for the kingdom, since my Sir. 
of him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. <coughs> Excuse me. At this time, the children may be excused to head up to Children's Church. And as they head out, the rest will sing Solid Rock. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And please be seated. We take time to pray together in his name, together before him, and lift up our hearts, pray for the people that are so desperately in need of Christ that we know and love. Praying for our world situation with both Israel and Palestine and also the Ukraine and other hot spots around the world and the struggles we're going through in our country. Uh, we need to pray for those around us. We've got several members this week uh, uh, in the hospital. Uh, Pat Jones, her shoulder replacement surgery got infected and then she's having a, a, her second cleaning of that on Monday. Uh, Patricia Culp is doing a little bit better and is able to talk. Um, Janie Perez's mother had a, some kind of stroke and is up at Shoreline. And uh, Mario Abrignani uh, came down with pneumonia on top of everything else. So uh, keep all of them in prayer. And then you've got your church as God leads us, guides us, directs us. Pray for us as a body that we will know what God's will is. Pray for each other. Uh, we're grateful for all of you out in, in uh, Trunk or Treat on Tuesday. It was cold. The crowds were down, but, but we were able to minister to some people. And so pray. Pray that we'll continue to have an effect there. And uh, so you lift each other up in prayer. This altar is open. Maybe you want to come and pray for this church, pray for this neighborhood, your schools. Maybe you've got someone special you want to pray for. We invite you to the altar. Uh, we'll have someone up here to pray with you if you want someone to pray with you. So let's bow our heads at this time. And let's turn our hearts towards God.
Our Lord and our God, your people have come before you with hearts that are struggling, struggling with their personal issues, struggling with where you're leading them in life, struggling with health issues, struggling with things that consistently drag them down. And God, we're looking to you for help. We're looking to you for healing. We're looking to you for hope. We're looking to you to see you do a great and mighty thing that only you can do. We open our hearts up to you, Lord, to lead and guide us, to heal us, to steer us in the right way, to let us know where we've been wrong, to convict us of our many sins, that we might turn from them, to show us that we can really take steps, starting today, that's going to start making things better. And best of all, Lord, to give us the comfort today that you are working on our issues. That when we cry out to you, you listen, you hear, and you act. You are not a God who doesn't care. You are not apathetic to our problems. But in fact, you want to get right down in the middle of us. And that's why you sent us Jesus. Just as Jesus left that throne and walked right down in the middle of us, lived among us as a man, born in a stable, and, and, and grew as a human, and tempted just like we are yet without sin. And then he died for us. You wanted to heal our problems so badly, you sent your son, your only begotten son, to die for us. To take our punishment upon that cross. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. And that's where it all starts, Lord. Do we want a new start? We start with Christ. Yes. That right here, right now, today, somebody could call upon his name and say, Lord Jesus, it's a mess right now and I don't know what to do, but I do know I need you. I know I need you, Lord. I'm a sinner. I, I have no hope without you. Yes. Let them know that praying that to you right now, Lord, means that you're listening. That's right. And that if they pray that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins and rose from the grave on the third day, they will be saved right here, right now. Yes. That that simple prayer, Lord, can start to change us on the inside. Amen. That all the issues on the outside, if we start with what's on the inside, Lord, we realize now... We're equipped to deal with all these circumstances, yes. all these people, all these relationships. Amen. So God, we pray that someone is calling on your name. Yes. We pray that each person here today as they are struggling is realizing they are not alone in this struggle. You led them into this building today. You led them among this people. And here you are, your Holy Spirit moving among us, speaking and opening our eyes up and enabling us to hear from you today. Amen. So God, don't let us think anyone's being singled out. It's you. Yes. Yes. It's you reaching down to us and saying, listen, yes. watch, yes. be part of this. Right. I'm speaking to you. Yes, Lord. What a wondrous thing it is that you do care, Lord. Right. And we pray, Lord, for our shoeboxes as those get ready that they will reach children that you want to reach. We pray, God, for Israel and the war it's having against terrorists. We pray, God, that you will use this for your will. And, and again, Lord, if this, is, if this is your sign of the end, then so be it. Come, Lord Jesus. And until then, Lord, we do pray, though, that many people are coming to know you as Savior, both in Israel and Palestine, even among the Hamas and Hezbollah and, and Iranians and Iraqis, that, that they too are coming to know you because of the terror that's been inflicted. But they're going to find out you are greater than that terror. You are greater than those rockets. You are greater than those armies. That you, Lord, can give everybody a new life. So we pray for that, Lord. We pray also, God, for our neighbors around us, that this church would be the light it needs to be, that we would serve you as you see fit, that we could be united in whatever your will is regarding whether we stay here forever or if you're moving us to a new place. We ask you, God, that that be your will, not ours. Lord, that you would open up doors, close them, work the circumstances. Make it clear to us, Lord, how you're leading us. Amen. Because we want to follow you. Above all else, Lord, let our light shine. Let our light shine brightly that wherever we go, wherever we are, people know that you love this group of people right here. Yes. And they carry your gospel. That's right. 
That gospel is the only thing that gives us hope. So we pray for that, Lord. Yes. We pray for all these things because we want to see you do great things in Corpus Christi. Right. So we say it all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, all of us together saying, Amen. Join with me in singing in Christ alone. <laughs> Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when driving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love. And righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, my distance lost his grip on me, for I am his, and he mind, but with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he remains or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand till he or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand at this time if we stand for the offering we'll sing the family of God I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad. in the fountain cleansed by his blood joined us with Jesus 
us as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Church, will you pray with me? Our most precious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, dear Lord, that we can come to your place of worship and worship you on a free basis, dear Lord. Use us, dear Lord, as your witnesses that we can proclaim the gospel news and that we can take these tithes and offerings, dear Lord, that uh, to further your kingdom, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much, dear Lord, that we can do the, these things. Thank you that you send us your son, that he died for us so our sins could be forgiven. We pray that your son will come a second time as a mighty king, dear Lord, king of kings. We love you, Jehovah God, and we ask you all these things through your mighty son, our Lord and Savior and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
with you. Good morning again. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. That's in your New Testament. Um, it's going to be a little ways past the Gospels. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you've got the book of Acts. Then you've got Romans. Then you've got 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be doing a short little series here before Christmas gets here um, regarding unity in His church. And today talking about the idea of reducing division. Um, and the idea here is whatever we do, we got to do it together. Uh, so often the Bible talks about being of one heart, one mind. We saw in our scripture reading this morning how important it is to Jesus that he prayed for that. That our unity, and, and, and dwell on that thought sometimes, that our unity in his church would be so much so it's just like the unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That tight, that intimate, that we too could be that. And he says, as we read this morning, so that the world would know that we've been loved by God. This isn't about kumbaya and let's all get along. This is about a commandment from our God that we be unified in one heart and one mind. So we're going to start in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 10 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. If it's not too uncomfortable, please would you stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but besides that I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you want to teach us and how you want to draw us together. We pray, God, that you'll overcome all our differences, all our preferences, and enable us to truly serve you in a united way. We say these things in the name of your Son, Christ. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. We often look at the church in the Bible as, man, they must have had it perfect. They all got to hear from Jesus and from Paul, and they, they were the people whom these first letters were written to. We read the book of Acts and look at the amazing growth the early church had. But we find out Charlie Brown can give us a little bit of wisdom to what life was like for them. Charlie Brown once said, church would be great if it wasn't for all the people. And that's kind of true if we get right down to it. Because as we read about the great things that happen in the Bible, 3,000 people saved in one day. People joined together and sharing food and all that stuff. And then quickly we find out, yeah, but they didn't want to let some of them in because they weren't Jewish enough. Or maybe they didn't want to reach out to these people because of where they lived. And, and then we get into the epistles, the letters, of which 1 Corinthians is one. And we find out life wasn't all that rosy for them. I mean, right here we got people splitting in the church over who baptized them. Who their favorite Bible teacher was. Who their favorite preacher was. In fact, we see this all through the New Testament. And it's not just... The weaker Christians, no, no, no. We see the, the, the man the Holy Spirit inspired to write here in 1 Corinthians. His name was Paul. He was an apostle. We often call him the Apostle Paul. He even ran into something like this. In the book of Acts, it mentions that he and a guy named Barnabas, they had a contention. They were out there spreading the gospel. They were out there serving God. But the contention between them became so sharp they parted from one another. See, there was this young guy with him named Mark. 
Um, and Mark uh, went out with him, and after a few weeks, he said, look, man, I'm, I'm homesick. i got to go back home. And so he goes home. Well, they're ready to take another journey, and Mark says, can I go? And Barnabas says, yes. And Paul says, no. And the contention became so sharp that these two great missionaries of the Lord, these two great servants of Christ, one went this way, one went that way. Now, to end that story, it had a happy ending. That guy, Mark, he grew up and wrote a gospel called, guess, Mark. There you go. All right. And then uh, Paul and Barnabas, they went their separate ways, but they both did great things for the Lord. Uh, but even talented people like that. And then you'll have stuff like two ladies at the church in a place called Philippi. You're going to love these names. The names were Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, we see in other places where they are sometimes praised because of their faithfulness. But then he says to them, I implore Euodia and Syntyche, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. These two ladies were leaders, influential in their church. And he's telling them, you guys need to learn to get along because some people like Syntyche, some people like Euodia, they probably just, whichever name they can pronounce more easier, they went to that side, right? And they figured, but things like that can cause division among God's people. And he think that was bad. He says to the church of Galatia, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Some churches really struggle. Some people just can't get along. They're like Congress. I mean, we will jump on any chance we get to insult, run down, pick on, insinuate that we can, even though they're our brothers in Christ. We would never do that here though, Pastor. No, of course we wouldn't. That's just other churches. But I'll tell you, we need to be careful. Uh, the devil gets a foot in the door and there's no telling how much damage he can do. We get our preferences, we get our likes, our dislikes, and it can spread like a disease. Do you know what they did? Do you know what they're trying to do? And we tell our friend and our friend changes. Do you know what they've already done? And we've changed it from going to do to already done. And they didn't even ask anybody and we start to get ideas in our heads. Why does this kind of ha thing happen? We like this pastor. We like the youth pastor better. We like that guy better. We like that gal better. What happens? Well, the causes of division in church are rooted primarily in some of this stuff right here. The number one thing is this church right here and every church, we're just a bunch of sinners. We are all imperfect in this room. The kids upstairs are imperfect. Everybody who's on our roll, our list of members is imperfect. We are the people of God, yes. Jesus Christ came into our faith, life, yes, and he changed us, yes. And we are told and commanded by Jesus to love one another, and we do our best. Just every once in a while. If you've raised kids, brothers and sisters, you know, and probably you were one when you were growing up. Boy, there was a hatred running between you about the time you're 10, 11, 13 years old. You fight, you struggle, you pick on, you steal from, you do all that stuff. Then when you grow up, you realize we really do love each other. And we get along better, hopefully. Others, we grew up together and we've never talked in 10, 15 years. Coming into the holiday season, those kind of issues rise up. And we look at our family and we realize, yeah, our family's not together. Why does it happen? Because even our family is just a bunch of sinners. We've got to realize that we have been tainted because we're human beings, we are imperfect, and we're just naturally this way. We, we think in terms of win and lose. That if I forgive you for the pain you caused me, you beat me. If I let it go that you took something from me or that you hurt me, I've lost to you. We think in terms of win or lose, I've got to keep on top of you. If I'm the one that says I'm sorry first, then that means you won. Oh no. And you may not put it in those terms, but let's face it, that drives a lot of us in our families and even in our churches. Whatever differences and whatever struggles interpersonal between us, 
we keep thinking in terms of win and lose and that's why we don't want to apologize that's why we don't want to forgive that's why we don't want to appear as if we're the weaker one in this relationship and so we hold fast to our division we hold fast to our point of view we make it the most important thing about us we're leaving someone out though but we begin as we ignore what Christ has told us that we think in terms of win or lose and then we start when someone does try to apologize or say anything we start to interpret words in light of our feelings I know she said was she was sorry but I don't think she meant it you apologize but I don't, it, it really wasn't what you said it's the way you said it and what are we saying with that we're starting to let our emotions and our feelings interpret we can all sit there and hear the same person say four score and 20 years ago and one of us say wow he's reciting a great speech and the other one's saying I hate him he's making us do math and we're like that it can be that quick that simple because I don't like the topic he's talking about I'm gonna automatically shut it down I don't like the direction this is going and my feelings don't like it so even though they're trying to say something to me uh, no my frustration my insecurity I mean that's coloring everything I hear you, you, you could write down what they said and you might have total agreement with it but because it came out of their mouth in the way it came out we suddenly don't want to believe it we don't want to buy into it division get happens because we interpret what other people are doing and saying with our feelings and I'm gonna tell you a big reason we have disunity kinda of goes back to number one we're all sinners is this one right here we are disconnected from God but don't you believe pastor if someone comes to know Jesus as their Savior that once they're saved they're always saved yes but I'll tell you what, you know how, oh good, I left my cell phone in the office. You know how you're talking to someone on your cell phone and you start picking up about half of what they're saying because you got a bad reception there? Sometimes your prayer life's like that, isn't it? But it's not God's fault. You spent so much time not listening or maybe you haven't charged your battery enough by sticking with him a lot more often. You're missing what he's saying. You don't get into the Bible so you forget what the Word has been saying to you, what God is trying to communicate to you. You skip church, you skip Bible study time, you skip fellowship, and you wonder why you're so disappointed in everyone else because you're getting disconnected from God. There's a passage about that in 1 Corinthians. Kind of summing up the end of the argument of what's going on in chapter 1 shows up in chapter 3. You are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Well, pastor, we're humans, aren't we? Yes. But if you start reading 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3, he starts talking about being a spiritual person. That because Jesus Christ died for our sins upon that cross, and we have invited him into our life, we don't just get Jesus. We also get the Holy Spirit. He also moves into us. He indwells us. He empowers us. He seals us, marks us as gods. He is there to guide us, to enlighten us. In fact, you cannot understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit's help. So if you have trouble understanding the Bible, take a good long look. Am I a Christian? Am I a believer in Christ? But he's saying, but instead of being spiritual and let the Spirit have His way in your life, you are still of the flesh. You are still reacting to feelings, emotions, desires, passions. You are not dealing with the higher power. You are still of the flesh. And while there is jealousy and strife among you, that's a great big sign of it. If you are disagreeing with everybody you know actually does love you, but you can't get along with them, that is fleshly. That is earthly. As he says here, behaving only in a human way. Yes, we're humans. But we have Christ. Because we have Christ, we have God the Holy Spirit dwelling in us also. We are not like others. So we should not behave in a human way. We behave in a godly way, a spirit-led way. We should 
be led by God, His Word, His Spirit, our prayer life, all of those things. As we struggle with the visions, we are not of the flesh. We are of the Lord. We are of the Spirit. We have higher values. We realize that this life is not all there is, but that one day we will stand before God and be asked, what did you do with the opportunities I gave you? How did you manage through resources, your generosity? How did you manage that gospel I gave you? Did you ever share it? Did you ever pray for people? Are your values higher? But I'm struggling right now with my own issues, Pastor. Yes, and you know what? Jesus said, you know, if we... we First, the kingdom of God, those things that are above. All these things that you're wrestling with right now, whether it's money, whether it's relationships, whether it's clothing, whether it's shelter, whether it's any of that stuff, all these things shall be added unto you. We start by getting our eyes on Him. We've got such a big focus on ourselves. I don't see how this helps because we're fleshly. We're just thinking about ourselves. Let's start putting our mind on the things above. That we would look to Jesus Christ and say to him, by the power that you went to that cross and by the power that raised you from the dead, is that power, is that actually for me? And the answer is yes. That belief in Christ transforms you into a new person. That maybe you've had wrong attitudes and wrong actions, but right now Christ has changed us. We don't have to be that way anymore. Because being that way is a cause of division. Being that way is a cause of, of, of arguing and the cause of jealousy, the strife that is mentioned in this passage. So often, because we don't seek Him, we become contrary, as we like to say in Arkansas. Everybody comes up, we, we're just against it. We're against it. Just If they say they like the Cowboys, we like... They like the Astros, we like the Rangers. I mean, it's just automatic like that. But there are some of us that need to realize, let's get our minds on things above. We're all Texans. <laughs> We're all Christians. We're all members of Travis Baptist Church. And we should have that same mind with us. So why is unity so important then? There we go. The significance of unity. This is part of our scripture reading this morning. That Jesus prayed for it. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. As we say, Jesus prayed for it, but guess when he prayed for this? What's going on in John chapter 17? It's just after that upper room stuff and he is gone he's probably in the garden of Gethsemane and after he has prayed not my will father but thine he is now praying for his disciples and this is what he said part of it is here that they would be one father just as you are in me and I'm in you the kind of unity between the father and son he wants to see in us what are we saying about this then how important is it number one it is the heart of Christ you and I would be able to get along like this, that we'd be that united as the Father and the Son are, is His heart. He's going to die in a few hours. He's not going to be with us until the resurrection. And what is He praying for? That we would get along with one another. He saw it many times. He's walking along with His disciples. Hey, uh, Jesus, John and James ask, can we sit at your right hand and, and my brother here at your left hand? And, uh, and Jesus said, no, y'all are missing the point. If you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the servant. And other disciples get mad because those guys were asking who could sit there. And Jesus reminded them, unless you become a servant, you're not going to be worth a thing to me. Unity is the heart of Christ. So much so that he prayed for it in desperation. In his moment of need, in the moment of struggle, he prayed that we would be one. Why? Well, it validates the gospel. That the world may know, that the world may believe that you sent me. What would make the world believe? Seeing God's people get along. You know what the world sees? They see churches that are hypocritical. They see churches in, in disarray. They see 
abusiveness, they see the failures, they see all of those things, and, and maybe they don't really ever go to church, but they read that in the newspaper, and they're thoroughly convinced that's what the church is. But what if they walked into a church and found out, we don't care who you are or where you're from, we're going to try our best to love you. You can have a place here. You come to Christ. You got mess in your life, he will clean that up. You can come. And when they realize that, they realize that they may believe that you really sent me, that God really did send his son to save sinners. When they see sinners like us loving sinners like them. That we may think they're not our kind of people. Well, who is your kind of people? You are just, again, sinners saved by grace. So that's why unity is so important. So what can we do then? Number one, you and I need to start focusing on the mission. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the Christ, cross of Christ should be of no effect. He continues in this next several verses talking about this message may not make sense to anyone, but this message, this mission what we have, that Jesus died and rose again, that is our mission. That is our message. Carpet color, Astros, versus rangers, none of that matters when we get focused on is the gospel going out? Is the gospel being proclaimed? In what situation can we better proclaim that gospel? He didn't send us just to meet on Sundays. He doesn't want us, and it's good that we do, and that's part of it, but it's not just to meet, it's to meet and then get sent out for Monday. That we leave this place energized, empowered, encouraged, to go out there and fight those battles that are facing you Monday. Whether at school, whether at home, whether at work. I hate to use the words battles, but that's what it feels like when you get there on Monday, isn't it? And on Tuesday, and if you make it to Wednesday, and you'd like to think the weekend's just around the corner, and sometimes it doesn't feel it is. But get your eyes back on the mission. What did God do? He saved you for eternal purposes. And so we ought to humbly... Reflect on who we are. What do I mean by that? Let's top down to chapter 1, verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, when you start thinking, I'm right. When you start thinking, my opinion is better. When you start thinking, I'm on the right side here and the truth is behind me, let's stop for a minute. What kind of people does God work with? Who are God's people? I am one of God's people and that's why you should listen to me. All right, but let's look. What are God's people like? He has chosen, number one, foolish things in the world. So number one, I'm a fool. Number two, He's chosen the weak things of the world. So I'm not just foolish, I'm weak also. Number three, not only am I foolish and weak, he has chosen, verse 28, the base things of the world and the things which are despised. So now I am foolish, weak, I'm basic, I'm despised. And yet God wants to use me. And you may say, that's not my opinion of myself. If you ever looked at yourself in light of the glory of Jesus Christ, that's exactly how you're going to feel. That you are but a fool. You are despised by the world. You are as basic as it gets. You are not all the things you think you are. We don't like it that Jesus humbles us. But once we've been humbled like this, Oh, do we have power? Verse 29, because none of us can glory in ourselves. The glory is of God. See, the reason we're unified is because I'm not looking for what I want. I'm looking for what he wants because I can't trust myself. I'm a fool. I am weak. I am despised. I am basic. I am not all that. Y'all don't be listening to me. Listen to him. Don't be following me. Follow him. Get down on your knees and pray and see, is he leading me as your pastor in the right way? Get down on your knees and pray and seek and ask, is he leading our church in the right way? 
Well, Pastor, I don't think you are. Have you been praying about that, or is that just your opinion? You foolish, despicable, weak, base person. Isn't that what we're being told here? Because see, the world thinks our gospel is lunacy because this guy 2,000 years ago died on a cross and rose to the grave makes a difference in 2023. The answer is yes. Our Savior lives. That's our message. And we go back to chapter 2, man. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you'll never get it because the Spirit is the one opening your eyes up to that message. If you understand the gospel of Christ, that means God is working on you. If today is making sense to you, God is working on you. It's not Pastor David, it's the Holy Spirit. And you better listen to him. We are fools. We are weak. And the glory is not of us, it's of him. Which means it's not about me. Look at verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that is, as it, writ, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now, I called you a lot of names, fools, despicable, basic, weak, but look what Jesus makes us now. Back at verse 30. But of him you are in Christ, and he became wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. See, I am righteous. Why? Because of Jesus. I am redeemed. Why? Because of Jesus. I am sanctified and holy. Why? Because of Jesus. Despicable, foolish, weak, yeah. But you know what? That's me on my own. With Jesus, look what I've become. This is why my opinions start to die down a little bit because I realize everything I got is about Christ. And whether you and I, and we can't decide, is this church going to re uh, represent the Carol or Veterans Memorial or are we going to be a king church or are we going to be a... It doesn't matter. We're going to represent Christ. Whether we're going to represent Cowboys versus Texans, UT versus Aggies, doesn't matter. We're going to represent Christ. And that should be the first thing we're all always seeking. Because he's going to use all of us. And this is the kicker here. Accept the various ways that you can fulfill his will. Now we're jumping over to chapter 12 now. What, pastor? Yes. Because this is kind of where he sums up that message. Because in chapter 12 we find out this. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. My body, I got ten fingers, I got two knees, one of them's brand new by the way. I got two feet, most of ten toes, I've got two ears, two eyes, you know, I got all this stuff in my body. I got a pancreas, I got a liver, I got a colon, I got a big colon, I got a small intestine, I got all that stuff. My intestine does not look like my feet, nor do they talk much, I don't think. But boy, I want both of them, don't I? I got ten fingers here. People can function with nine, eight, none. I want all ten, though, don't I? I got two eyes. One sees a lot better than the other one does, and I'm grateful for both. What I'm saying there is this. I need every single one of them. They got a different function, but they fulfill one purpose. They get me around. In the same way, this church, the body of Christ, each one of us having a different role, each one of us having a different place, and we'll talk about that in a couple weeks, each one of us having a different ministry or a different way we fulfill that ministry, and yet every single one of us is important to the heart of Jesus Christ. You are not in this church by accident. He brought you here. Accept that. Believe that. Pray about that. Did you bring me here, Lord? Am I a part of this? How do I fit in? Pastor, where do I fit in? I don't know. Have you prayed about it? Be praying about it. Because this ultimately is to remind us, we may like not just UT and the Aggies. We might be a Red Raider. We might be a Baylor Bear. We might be a Rice Owl. We might be a Stephen F. Austin Lumberjack out in Nacogdoches in East Texas. That might be our big team. It doesn't matter. 
because where you went to school, what football team you root for, who your favorite baseball team you got nothing to do, we're about Christ. We're about Christ. So we pray how Christ is going to continue working through us. We pray about how Christ wants to use us and bless through us. Because that's part of what we're here for is to be a blessing to this community around us. How does Jesus want me to do that? Are you praying about that? Are you asking him to show you what your role might be, what your position might be? Now, we talk about some things here at church, what the future might be. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. He's going to do it through us. About a year ago, we had some financial difficulties, and I said there may come a day where God, what we do here is done in a different way. It might even be done in a different place. It might be done in different ways that we've never tried before. You all said amen that day. I hope you'll still say amen to that, because what if? What if God makes changes that we so that we can serve him better. What if God keeps us right here so if we can serve him better? Are you praying about that? Why don't you just pray to serve him better? Because if I'm serving him, I ain't got a whole lot of time to worry about how I don't like your football team or I don't like your opinion on certain other issues, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or anything else. Let's be about Jesus Christ. And that mission he gave us. And as we serve him, we will find out we can be as different as all get out. Look around this room. People tell me that Sunday morning is the most segregated Sunday or segregated day of the week. But look around in this room. Not here. Praise the Lord. Why? Because God brought us together. And by God bringing us together, that means he wants us to serve him together. So let's pray for that. And maybe you're saying, I could serve God too. And if you've never known Christ as your Savior, the answer is yes. That's what we're going to be about this month. Helping you maybe find a little bit of purpose, a little bit of meaning, a little bit of, I could be more than what I am right now because of what Christ has done. He died upon that cross for you and rose from the grave on the third day. He suffered the punishment for your sin. But he also rose from that grave to tell us, I've got victory over sin, over death, over all the mess that you think drags you down. Give your heart to me and set your heart on me and I can give you a new value system. I can let you start seeing things that you never knew were that important that they would become more important. That when you realize before God that you have nothing to stand on, no good works, you're not good enough for Him, but He takes you anyway, that humility lets you say, just use me, Lord. I, I may have nothing, but I got you and that's all I need. Because I'm redeemed and sanctified and all that stuff because of what Christ did. Are you? Can you say that today? If not, we're going to sing a song here in a moment. And if you're ready to take a step and say, Pastor David, I want that to be true of me. I want to have Christ. Come down here and let me pray with you while we're singing in a moment. Let me pray with you about whatever you're going through. Let me just pray that, that God would bless you and guide you and open your eyes up to the steps you need to take. Right here, right now, believing that Jesus did that for you, gets you into his family. Saying, I want to leave my life behind. I can't do it anymore. I want to follow you, Christ. Right now, here today, you can say that to him. Right now, here today, that takes you from, from wherever you are right now to becoming a child of God. Are you ready for that? Maybe others of you have other things you're wrestling with, but during this time we sing, be in prayer. Be in prayer as you sing, all right? Let's, let's bow our heads for a moment. Our Lord and our God, we are so grateful that you have come and died for us and rose again. Forgive us for those times when we're too selfish, we're too focused on our own feelings, our emotions, our desires, our own passions, instead of the one central thing you brought together to unite us. Help us to realize this mission you've given us, to lift you up before everybody, can actually give us better perspective on the rest of our life's issues, if we'd start with you. So today, Lord, we're praying that someone comes to know you, that they believe right now that Jesus 
suffered the punishment that they deserve on that cross. But that he has victory over that punishment because he rose from the grave. And if we simply pray, Lord Jesus, I believe you died and rose. Come into my life that you will answer it. That you will answer, Lord, and make them one of your children. As many as receive you, Lord, you give the power to become a child of God. The rest of us, Lord, as we pray, we're praying. Help us to serve. Help us to get our eyes on you. That the world, that this city might see that you have loved us and that you love them. We pray these things in that holy name. Amen. So we're going to sing. If you want to come and have me pray with you, we can do that right now. If you're ready to take a step closer to Christ, come and let me pray with you about that right now, okay? So let's all stand and we're going to sing, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let this be a prayer from your heart as you sing it. That you truly are saying to him, I want to turn my eyes upon you, Lord. But as we sing, come if you want me to pray with you. Come if you're ready to take a step. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. upon him through death and to life and through all the struggles through all the pain you've gone through he passed and we look to him, him oh, and as we can put those things down we become one together with our eyes turned upon Christ more than conquers we Thank you all so much for being here today. I do appreciate you. And let's remember to pray for one another and lift each other up. Pray for our neighborhood and the gospel reaching out there, okay? Pray for our schools our kids are going to, your kids are going to, that, that uh, there might be Christian witness there among the kids and the teachers and the support personnel who go to church, that their light might shine this week. Julio, would you come and dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the word that you brought us today. Thank you for Pastor David who delivered it. Thank you for our, they all our music ministry who brought the music, Father. Just be with us, be with this congregation, and may we continue to be a church with, with our eyes focused on you, with our, our minds and hearts focused on you, Father. Thank you for all you do. Be with us and help us get home in peaceful, in peace. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.